and welcome to the group exhibit Hydrogen and Fuel Cells, Hanover Fair 2012. We're on our second day and I hope you've already started to see a lot of interesting things. Please do come in and sit down. This is uh, an interesting and free lecture with drinks, lots of comfortable seats. Where the topic here is going to be hydrogen mobility activities at Fraunhofer Ise. This is a talk going to be, I'll be interviewing Dr. Nata, Z uh, sorry, Dr. Nata Camo. Please join me in inviting her on stage. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. So how have you been enjoying your time so far here? So far it's been great, meeting new people, meeting old friends, so it's very nice. Wonderful. So uh, the department that you work in is a fuel cell department, uh, but you are at the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems. How is it that you're in the middle of a solar energy system institute and you're a fuel cell division? So um, um, Fraunhofer ESA, or Institute for Solar Energy Systems, um, started 30 years ago. And about 20 years ago, they had um, a project for a sustainable home and they needed a PEM electrolyzer for that. And in order to do that, they needed a new team to work on the electrolyzer, the PEM electrolyzer, and that's basically how the department started. We still, until today, do PEM electrolyzers, but of course, we're also specialized in anything PEM fuel cell related, and we work on different projects, and this is basically pretty much the history behind how the department was started. And if you look at Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems, so it's energy systems, so we do work on anything that's energy systems related and fuel cells are energy systems. Right, that fits well in. Very well, yes. uh, Do you have many people in your department? Um, so the department is probably the smallest in Fraunhofer Institute, um, in Fraunhofer ESA. So we're about 80 to 90 people but we're always growing and we're very strong at what we do. Um, the institute is around 1,200 people, so we're pretty much maybe 7% of the institute total, but we try to make sure that we're always seen with our great work. <laughs> right, I, I understand that some of your, your core competencies lies in the characterization of fuel cells, PEM fuel, fuel cells in particular. Could you please describe to us some of your, your specialized equipment that you use? So um, maybe I'll describe Three different, um, um, three different activities that we are specialized in. So as you said, characterization fuel cells. Um, so for example, we have an environmental chamber and an environmental cha chamber, we can do any work uh, with, um, pr um, with preconditioned air and the preconditioned air could be uh, from negative 20 degrees Celsius up to plus 50 degrees Celsius with all levels of humidification. Um, and then we could supply up to 2000 cubic meter per hour of conditioned air. Um, this is some, if you're interested in something um, in our um, environmental chamber, you can come to our booth, which is booth uh, C60, and you can ask my colleagues about it. Uh, the second thing that we do, which is part of the characterization, is we have um, multi-channel segmented fuel cells, so it's pretty much, we have 50 uh, channels. And with this uh, segmented cell, we can uh, measure um, the current distribution, we can measure high frequency resistance, and we also can do electrochemical um, impedance spectroscopy. What's very interesting about our equipment for the, uh, the um, um, segmented cell is that with the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, we can also uh, protrude um, more um, one segment um, instead of the entire cell, or we can do the entire cell as well. And this is something that is specialized at Fraunhofer ESA. Um, something that would be interesting when we look at, um, when we measure the ice or the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, is we look at water transport through the cell. And this is something that is one of the main themes in uh, one of our collaborations, which is PAMCAD. Basically, it's a uh, polymer electrolyte membrane uh, fuel cells. Um, CAD is for Canada, Deutschland. So we have a collaboration with Canadian partners and pretty much um, I'm Canadian, so I'm I as Deutschland. Well. We're so. a little proud Canadian <laughs> on the stage so, at the moment. Yeah, so that shows the collaboration between Canada and uh, Fraunhofer ESA, um, which is something pretty cool. So you're saying this, this uh, multi-channel tool will allow you to get a map all across the, the cell, not just 
the cell in general, but local mapping of, of the water flow across it. And, and why, why would that be interesting for someone to measure? So um, um, basically, it's, it's not necessarily just the water. So we look at the current distribution and we understand the water, how the water goes from the anode, the cathode, and so on and so forth. This is important for any application of fuel cell because um, as um, many of us know, the byproduct is water and we might have some problems with the management of this water. And if we understand exactly how it flows um, and depending on the flow properties, does it go from the anode to the cathode? This is something that's very interesting. And to also understand this from um, a small scale. So if we understand it on the cell scale, we can expand it to the stack. So right now, the first step is we understand it on the cell scale, and then we can also do this electrochemical impedance spectroscopy on um, a 50 cell, basically, stack, because we have the 50 channels, and then we can look at it from a stack perspective. And if you understand your system, you can learn how to better design it. Exactly. Right. And then the third thing that we're working on, which is very, very interesting, is that we call it the Beats A Life. So um, it's basically, we look at the contamination uh, from air on our fuel cell. So the way we look at it is we have um, a system that is um, located so, um, at four different locations in Freiburg. Um, so for example, I will talk about two different locations. So for example, we have one on top of the mountain, which is fresh air. There, um, the contaminants are very small. Um, uh, the concentration is very low. And then we also have it on a busy street where the contamination could be high due to the exhausts of uh, vehicles and so on and so forth. And what's interesting about this project is that we actually know the contaminants, the concentration of the contaminants, because there's a collaboration between us and the weather station in, uh, in Germany. So they give us data about the contaminants that are um, present at that time. So they're also giving us transient time of these contam um, transient measurements of these contaminants so we can look back at our measurements that are also transient and we can see okay how is this affected now what's interesting about this project is uh, we do not um, so we do not supply the air and the air is supplied from the surrounding so what's interesting is that we can see that there is a trend between this, these contaminations and um, and the performance this is something that hasn't been done um, before, not that we, I know of, but uh, normally people when they uh, do contamination testing, it's in the lab. So basically I, su I supply high amounts of contaminants uh, to make sure that degradation happens in the time period that I want it, but this is not necessarily true in it's real. It's more real world conditions. Exactly. And so far, if you also come to our booth and you look at the results, so far these uh, cells have been working continuously for over 5,000 hours at the moment. So um, it's very interesting. This is something that we're all learning about as well. Um, and you Have can you get found a big difference? Have you found a, a strong correlation between air contaminants and performance? Yes. Yes, we of course uh, it, there is a big col um, uh, coloration. Um, um, there is a big um, correlation cor between the yes, two. Between the two, but also that what's interesting is that we found um, because especially the ones on the mountain, uh, when they were installed, the temperature was at around 20 degrees Celsius, and over the winter time it decreased, and now it's increasing again because it's warming up again. And um, what we're what we're seeing right now is that we have the performance going back up. So it's also temp very temperature dependent, which is something that we can see, and it's uh, we can see that it's very catalytic contamination that maybe we can um, um, uh, we can uh, reverse Re recover yes, from exactly so you had some some loss some performance degradation due to contamination yeah. and then when you you warm yeah. the cells back up in the spring yeah, you see a recovery of this yeah and um, another part of this project, also, if you look at our booth and also if you email any of us at the Institute and we send you any of our work, you will see that we also collect the liquid water that comes out of the cell. So when we collect that water, we can also look at what contaminants are in that water. So basically, we can maybe tell about uh, the degradation inside of the cell. So what particular degradation modes have you identified through this? So one, one that was... Um, um, interesting is um, when we find holes inside of our membranes, so sometimes the cells could, uh, uh, I guess, die because they no, lo no longer can work. Um, so um, we have high amounts of silicon inside of our water, water. So this is interesting. So I think these are maybe three main things that we are working on for characterization of the fuel cell. And due to the fact that we 
um, we have all this equipment and we have many other equipment as well. We can do certification uh, for fuel cells. And of course, if anybody's interested about this, they can always contact any of us. Great. Uh, we'd also like to hear a little bit more of uh, congratulations. Uh, recently, they have installed a, a fuel, a hydrogen fueling station. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? So this is very exciting because anytime we get a car uh, to refuel, we get to drive it, which is very, very, very cool. Um, so I, um, um, so the hydrogen fueling station was open um, in March. And um, it's basically the way it works is if you have a fuel cell car and you are in, are in the Freiburg area, you can refuel. And of course, you refuel for free, but that's if you have a hydrogen car. Um, at the moment, the way it works is it's by appointment only. Um, and then later on, once uh, um, we start maybe getting more cars, it will become that each person will have an electronic car that you can turn on the pump and you can actually use um, you can refuel by yourself. What's uh, really cool about our fueling station is that we have two pressures. So we have the 350 bar pressure and we have the 700 bar pressure. The reason this is uh, important is because it, it doesn't matter which car you drive, it depends on the manufacturer. It could be different from one manufacturer to the other. Uh, you can still refuel at our station. Have you had many customers come visit you at your, at your service? Um, so uh, last week, what I heard is that we had four car, different cars that we refueled. The ones that I know of and the ones that I've seen is two cars. Um, they're, um, they are made by Hyundai and they refueled because um, a team of journalists uh, drove from Norway all the way to, uh, they were driving, they were doing a, um, a north to south of Europe um, um, drive. So basically from Norway all the way down to Monaco. And what they wanted to show is that you can, uh, there's actually a hydrogen um, highway in Europe. And you don't need any extra uh, vehicles to be traveling with you in order to refuel your own cars. So it was a very interesting, um, interesting story to hear because we never, we didn't know that such a thing was going on, and also we got to drive the cars, which was pretty cool. We have in the institute, we have two B-class uh, Mercedes uh, um, cars, fuel, uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars that we are allowed to drive, and you find that each car drives differently. Um, I haven't myself driven. Um, any other cars beside the, besides the Hyundai. Maybe this week, maybe this Thursday, I'll end up driving the B-Class and then I can actually compare and see which one drives better. That's a very exciting thing to be a part of. Very and it's exciting. also worth noting that uh, the station is powered by green energy, is powered by a photovoltaic array. Yes, and it's totally our department. So it's kind of our baby. So because being in a very big institute and a very, very small department, it is really, really, really nice to have our own project that it's all us. So it's very nice. If you're ever in the Freiburg area, just give us a call and you're more than welcome to come and visit. Right. I hope somebody out there's got a hydrogen vehicle and would like to pay them a, a visit. Uh, at this time, before I go any further, is there any questions from the audience? Uh, anybody happening to have a hydrogen vehicle wanting to schedule a visit, maybe? No? Right, well, if you do have any questions, feel free to put up your hand at any time and, and stop us, and I'll, I'll come down to you. Um, so there is also a, a different project that later in this year might be, uh, should be starting. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? So this is something that is on a small, maybe a smaller scale, but something that is very, very interesting as well for us. We have kind of um, electrical bikes but they run on hydrogen fuel cells. Um, the whole idea behind this is that we can use them for post services. So the idea is that when once we get these bikes, because if you ever come to Fraunhofer ESA, you will see that we are a big institute. But the problem is that all the build we are scattered all over Freiburg, so we have many buildings everywhere. So if the internal mail in, at ESA, it's very difficult sometimes for them. So this is this will be something that they can use. They can use these. Uh, um, electric or hydrogen fuel cell uh, bikes and they can um, go from one building to the other. Um, uh, maybe another talk could be with Deutsche Post, but um, this is something that will start later this year and it's very exciting for all of us because anytime we get any toys, we can play with them and it's of course very, very nice. Yeah. 
Well, I do hope that you do get a chance to drive both the cars and, and the, the hydrogen-powered bikes when they come in. I hope so, too. <laughs> Are there any further questions from the audience? No, in that case, please thank me. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Nadesan <laughs> Kamo for, for giving us this exciting talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, as she mentioned, they're over at booth C60 if you'd like to talk to them further. It's just right over there. Uh, please do stick around. We have Dr. Christian Wunderlich uh, talking about uh, an update about high temperature fuel cell development at a different Fraunhofer Institute, uh, Fraunhofer IKTS. And this, was, uh, this is a subject on solid oxide fuel cells. So please do sit, or, sit have a drink, enjoy yourself. Thank you very much.